Okay, we're into video two for chapter three. We're going to take a look at the four emergent properties of water, properties that emerge because water is a polar molecule. So let's take a look. The first property is cohesion and adhesion. Water molecules tend to stick to each other and stick to other things. Just um, imagine filling up a glass of water and filling it up to the brim and then adding a little bit more water on top of that. You can do this. The water can be, oh, maybe an eighth of an inch above the brim of a, of a glass. You can do this because of water's cohesive nature. Well, why does water stick to itself? Why does it stick to other things? It's because water is a polar molecule and forms hydrogen bonds. That answer is what's going to come up every time practically today. So let's take a look a second. Oh, let's go back to this slide. Because water is a polar molecule, water is attracted to other water molecules. The partially positive uh, end of a, a hydrogen end of a water molecule is attracted to the partially negative charge on the oxygen end of a second water molecule. So we get a hydrogen bond. And these hydrogen bonds are forming and breaking and forming and breaking all the time in water. That helps water stick together and it helps water stick to other things as well. So those hydrogen bonds that form because water is polar uh, allow water to be adhesive and cohesive. And this is important for life on Earth, for living things. Why? Let me give you several examples. The first example comes from trees, actually. Cohesion and adhesion allows for water movement up large trees via something called transpiration. Let's see if I can write that on here with my pen. Alrighty. So transpiration is a process that you may have learned about. Ooh, that's definitely not my best writing. It's a process in which um, as a plant grows and lives, it gets water from the soil, and that water then moves up through the roots, through the trunk, through the leaves, and it evaporates at the leaf's surface. But as it evaporates at the leaf's surface, it creates a negative tension. And because water molecules stick to each other, what happens is that the water is kind of pulled up tiny little tubes in the tree, molecule by molecule, that are attached to each other because of cohesion and to the walls of these little tubes by adhesion, okay, due, due to hydrogen bonds that form between water molecules and between water molecules and the edges of these cells. These tubes are known as xylem, and this allows trees to move water all the way up to the tippy top of their branches without any expending any energy. Fantastic, uh, a process that allows plant life to grow big and to grow tall because of water's cohesive properties. If you've never gone out to see the redwoods or the sequoias in California, I strongly recommend it. It's so much fun to look up at a 300, 400 foot tree and realize that the water that it's getting from the soil is being moved up this tree by a process that doesn't even require energy. Pretty cool. Here's another reason that cohesion is important. Cohesion in water creates high surface tension. Surface tension. So because water sticks to itself, the surface of water is stretchy and things can live on it. It becomes a great microhabitat for living organisms. Spiders and whirligig beetles and oh, there's the Jesus lizard running on water. Uh, this is a part of a big, bigger, um, bigger food chains, bigger food webs, and parts of ecosystems, right? And so cohesion allows for animals to live on the surfaces of water. 
The second emergent property from water is moderation in temperature. We have a few definitions here to review. So moderation in temperature or water resists temperature changes. And we all know this, water resists temperature changes. At the beginning of the summer, when you go out to swim in Lake Michigan, it's so cold. Even if it's 95 degrees outside in June, the water can be so cold. It doesn't change temperature fast. All right, why is this? Well, well what is temperature? Temperature is the measure of heat intensity due to the average kinetic energy of molecules, I'm going to just put Ke, of molecules in a body of matter. Kinetic energy. So molecules are moving around. They have kinetic energy or energy of motion, right? And as they move faster, we say their temperature is higher. Their heat intensity is higher. As they move slower, they slow down. Their, their temperature is lower, okay? That's what temperature is by definition. Now water moderates temperature changes or resists changes in temperature. So it's hard to change the temperature of water, hard to make it go up, hard to make it go down compared to other things. Why? Why? Because water is a polar molecule. All right, let's think about that. Turns out water has a very high specific heat relative to other substances. Specific heat is the amount of heat required, either absorbed or lost, so either gained or lost, the amount of heat required to change the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. In other words, relative to other things, water, it takes a lot of heat to um, to to raise the temperature of water by one degree of one degree Celsius or to lower it. Water has a high specific heat. In fact, you've probably learned what the specific heat of water is. There are several different ways to describe it, but maybe you've heard that the specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. 4.18. Almost every other substance out there has a specific heat of less than one. So water has a really high specific heat relative to other substances. So it takes a lot of energy, either energy that's absorbed or lost, to change the temperature of water. Why? Because water is a polar molecule. Let's think about this. Imagine that you're cooking and you have a big pot of water that you're trying to boil on the stove. Maybe you're going to make some macaroni or something like that. So you've got the heat going down here, right? It takes a while for the water to get warm. In fact, you get impatient. You might even touch the water, and it's lukewarm, and, but the pan is already really hot. What's going on? You're trying to raise the temperature of water. You want it to boil so that you can add in your macaroni, right? But think about this pot of water. Every water molecule is polar and forms hydrogen bonds between water molecules, but those hydrogen bonds are forming and breaking and forming and breaking. So we see these are our hydrogen bonds that are forming and breaking, that are holding water together, so to speak. Now, think about this for a minute. <clears throat> what has to happen as the water, what happens for the water to get warmer? As the temperature goes up, what happens to the kinetic energy of the molecules? They're moving fast, right? And what do you think is happening to these hydrogen bonds? Are more of them breaking or more of them forming? Probably more of them are breaking. Some of the water even escapes as it boils, right? So as, as we're raising the temperature, we're adding heat to this thing, right? We're adding heat to the pot of water. The molecules are speeding up, but as they speed up, some of these hydrogen bonds are breaking. It requires a lot of energy to break bonds. So we're using a lot of the heat simply to break these bonds okay, before the temperature can, raise, can rise. 
It takes a lot of heat energy to break the hydrogen bonds because water is a polar molecule and forms hydrogen bonds. So water resists changes in temperature because you have to break all those hydrogen bonds to raise the temperature. The opposite is true too. What if you've got this um, water that you put into ice cube trays and you want to make ice? Then the water temperature, you want the water temperature to drop, to freezing. What happens as the water temperature is dropping? The molecules are moving more slowly. As they slow down, more hydrogen bonds are forming than are breaking. But forming bonds releases heat energy. And so as more bonds form, heat energy is released and that slows the drop of water temperature. So water resists the change in temperature. It, it slowly gets colder and colder and colder. Right. So why is this important to life on Earth, that water resists changes in temperature? That's this question. Well, it's important at at many levels. So if we're thinking about uh, local climate, large bodies of water can moderate local climate. So we've got big old Lake Michigan. If you go to um, Grand Haven or Holland or uh, a community along the lake shore during the summer, it's usually a little bit cooler out there than it is in Grand Rapids or even in Allendale. Why? Because that body of water is making the climate cooler around it. It's absorbing a lot of the heat energy in that area. And when it absorbs that heat energy, the, the climate nearby is cooler, okay? Because it can absorb a lot of heat energy without changing temperature much, right? And the opposite is true in the winter. This is true of the entire Earth. Think of how much water, how much liquid water is on our planet. That liquid water on our planet helps moderate Earth's temperature. And even within our, in our own cells, in our, inside of us, we have a lot of water. And that helps to moderate our temperatures. Our temperature doesn't go up quickly, it doesn't drop quickly, in part because of the abundance of water. Uh, another component of the moderation of temperature is evaporative cooling. I want you to read that on your own. It's kind of similar to um, what's going on with, um, with uh, the high specific heat. Um, water also has a high heat of vaporization, and you can check that out as well. Number three, the third uh, emerging property property of water that emerges out of its structure is that water expands when it freezes. In other words, ice floats. It doesn't sink. So why does ice float? Well, because water is a polar molecule. Let's see if that makes sense. So why does ice float? Now normally, when we think of substances, we think of um, you know substances as having three forms. Oh, they can either be a solid or a liquid or a gas, right? So if you had some molecule of a solid, the molecules would be pretty densely, pretty close to each other. In, a li in its liquid form, the molecules are usually a little more spread out. And then in its gaseous form, molecules are very far spread apart, right? That's not quite right for water, okay? In water's liquid form, so if we look at water's liquid form and water's solid form, water molecules are a little more closely packed. They're more dense than they are in their solid form. And so if ice is less dense than water, it floats. But why is it less dense? Because water is polar. Check this out. This is a picture of water molecules in an ice form and in the liquid form. Remember those hydrogen bonds that are transient in liquid water that form and break and form and break? When they form and break, especially when they break, water molecules can get kind of close to each other. So they're going to separate and then get close and separate and get close. But 
in ice. Those hydrogen bonds that form between water molecules, because water is polar, are kind of stuck there. And water forms a crystalline lattice that in, in which each water molecule is separated by, by a bond's length, by a hydrogen bond length. And so the water molecules are actually more spaced out than they are in liquid water. So ice floats. Why is this important for life on Earth? There are lots of reasons. Here's one. Um, because ice floats, uh, ponds and lakes and rivers and things like that um, don't freeze from the bottom up. They freeze from the top down, allowing for a space underneath the ice where animals can survive, survive the winter. Think about um, amphibians and reptiles in our local ponds that kind of burrow into the mud and just wait it out until until spring hits, spring hits again, and, and finally the ice, the ice leaves, right? Uh, so animals and plants can have a place to live in the water during the winter months. And also, the ice actually provides insulation for the water underneath it. It keeps it warmer, which again allows for plant life and animal life and other life to survive during those cold winter months. There's a little bit of information on the effect of climate change and how climate change has really affected sea ice and that affects all sorts of organisms. How much sea ice there is or how much sea ice has been lost has um, benefited some organisms and has really made other organisms um, struggle to survive. So check that out. Here's the fourth property of water that emerges from its structure. So water is an excellent solvent. In other words, it, things dissolve well in water. Many substances have an affinity for water, is what we like to say. So if you put uh, sugar in your coffee and stir it around, it just disappears, right? It's dissolved in water. Or if you put salt into water and stir it around, it just disappears. It's dissolved in water. We would say that these substances that have an affinity for water are maybe we would say hydrophilic, water-loving substances. So why is water such a good solvent? Because water is a polar molecule. All right, let's check that out. And then we'll ask these two questions as well, okay? Water is a polar molecule. So if you've got a cup of water or a beaker of water here and you add salt to it, what happens? Well, Remember that salt is made up of sodium and chloride ions that form ionic bonds between them. But because water is a polar molecule, water carries partial positive and partial negative charges. And they are attracted to the positively and negatively charged ions in salt. You can see here um, what really happens is that uh, water molecules, particularly the hydrogens, the partially positively charged hydrogens are attracted to the negative chloride ion. And surround that chloride ion, we say that a hydra hydration shell has surrounded the chloride ions. The sodium ions are surrounded by water as well, but they're surrounded by water with uh, the oxygen atoms facing them because the oxygen atoms are attracted to the positively charged sodium ion. And so the salt will become, uh, will become a hydration shell of water will kind of surround the, the ions in salt. The same is true for water-soluble proteins, for example. This big purple blob in this picture is a protein, and water molecules are attracted to it because it must have some partial charges on it. It must be hydrophilic to some extent. And you can see the water molecules are surrounding it. It becomes, it, 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 it becomes um, dissolved or partially dissolved in the water. So why is this important? Water is the solvent of life. What does that mean? Water is the solvent of life. 
many, many things dissolve in water. And we need these things, right? Many things dissolve in water, and we need these things to maintain life, whether we're talking about things that dissolve in the ocean or perhaps inside of us. Let's think about our blood for a minute. Our blood is made up of red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets, but also plasma. Plasma is primarily water with a lot of things dissolved in it, things that we need to move around our bodies, right? So some proteins, like insulin, for example, are moving around in the plasma. Nutrients like glucose that our cells need to make ATP. Wastes, things that we don't need, are dissolved in the plasma. Gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide are mostly carried by red blood cells, but they can dissolve in the plasma, too. And then there's ions like sodium ions and potassium ions and chloride ions, all sorts of ions that we need for our cells to function normally. Water is the solvent of life. Things dissolve well in water. Can everything dissolve in water? Is it a universal solvent? No. No way. Things that are hydrophobic, water-fearing, can't dissolve well in water, but many, many things do, and that's important for life on Earth. So those are the four properties of water that emerge from water's polar structure. There's one more topic. We'll cover that in our next lecture.